Thank you for staying to the end of the day. Thank you, moderators, for inviting me. And I want to congratulate all the prior speakers on the really fascinating work that's being done um, that has been shown so far. How do I um, progress? Yeah, the yellow green button here. I'm going to talk uh, about a topic that I don't know anything about because I've never done it, which most people would say you should keep your mouth shut. But that's my topic. <laughs> There's very little that's been done in the modern era in terms of liver transplantation for colorectal carcinoma, uh, and that's what we're going to tackle here. And so the question of whether we should and why we should or should not undertake this uh, at this time is, is uh, sort of addressed here. If we look at what overall progress has been made in the treatment of colorectal cancer generally, we can see that overall, although progress is somewhat slow, uh, for metastatic disease, for stage by stage, uh, for both colon and rectal disease by era from the 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, since 2000, there's progressive improvement in overall survival for all comers with colorectal disease. Is part of that due to improving chemotherapy? I think yes. Median overall survival um, in patients with metastatic disease from colorectal carcinoma receiving chemotherapy. If you look at this meta-analysis of published trials that were phase two innovative chemo trials uh, since 1995 onward, you see a progressive upward trend in survival rates. And uh, as has been previously um, shown by some of the prior speakers, does resection of metastatic disease really help? Yes, if we look back at old uh, natural history data, and this is uh, European data from patients who were deemed to be resectable before the mid-1990s, but chose against undergoing resection versus those who were found to have resectable disease and agreed with resection and went through it, you can see there's a market improvement in overall survival for resected patients in uh, matched cohorts. You couldn't do that study today. Um, but if we look at more modern outcome, this is um, a larger trial and looking at five-year survival of those who have liver-only disease that were resected versus those who were not resectable or not resected. And you can see uh, over 50% five-year survival and liver resection combined with modern chemotherapy in the modern area, area as compared to those who undergo only chemotherapy where it's around 18 to 20% uh, overall five-year survival. And if we look at longer term outcomes than five years in the modern era with modern innovative chemo and uh, resection techniques, five year survival again is around 50%. But you can see that if you look at longer term survival, it drops off to about half that at 10 years. Uh, and this is another larger uh, study, the uh, liver met study. It has both North American and European data entered into a large database and large numbers of studies uh, of patients. Again, you can see that combined chemotherapy with resection uh, in 15,000 patients. We have a similar uh, survival rate, about 30% in this study at 10 years. So subtotal hepatic resection is excellent when we can do it for uh, patients who are good candidates, but there are different disadvantages and we have a limited population that we can apply it in. Resection can't always be accomplished even as part of multimodality therapy. Um, we need to have a liver that is uh, relatively healthy like the one shown in the picture below that has a, uh, an ability to regenerate. Uh, and then there are post-resection uh, morbidities. And if you look at the top slide, it's just showing the typical uh, common case in which there are both large uh, bilobar metastases and also uh, very small satellite metastases. And some are just beyond the ability to be resected. Uh, also looking at NISQIP data and large numbers of patients, you can see that um, um, that even in large centers that do a high volume of liver resection, there's still a significant risk of liver failure after resection. So in the NISQIP data, it's about 5%, even in, uh, even in NISQIP uh, hepatobiliary uh, resection centers. Uh, and a common site of recurrence is still within the liver. So about 25 to 35% of recurrences occur in the remnant liver. <laughs> 
and margins are part of the puzzle and uh, also important. Uh, you can see the difference in survival as we go year to year out from uh, our one resection to if we can get greater than a one centimeter margin. And we all have seen, if we're doing liver resection cases, where the metastases sit right on the hilar plate on the bifurcation of the bile ducts and things like that where we uh, can do a radical resection but we'll have a limited margin. Uh, so sometimes, like in this case, it's just better to take the whole damn liver out. Since the early um, uh, natural history data uh, that I showed, we've also been able to better select biologically favorable disease. So both structural features like the number, size, uh, distribution, and total tumor burden uh, of the metastases are important. Uh, the location of the primary tumor in the colon, the CEA level uh, being very high, uh, synchronous uh, disease does worse than metachronous and the like. And we know now that there are certain um, genotypic factors like BRAF mutation and uh, microsatellite instability that also impact on what the likelihood of cure with combined state-of-the-art chemo and resection offer. So um, have we really looked at and tested it? Uh, Dave uh, here, Geller and I were around and knew Dr. Starzl when he was alive and remember the early studies of liver transplant that actually started in the 60s for colorectal metastases and even pancreatic metastases to the liver. And they failed with very uh, um, extremely high early recurrence rates. But in the current era, we don't have a whole lot to go on to, to answer the question. So the European Liver Transplant Registry reported on 58 cases that underwent liver transplantation in the relatively modern era, but 80% of these patients received their transplants before 1995 when I, who have been doing liver transplants for 25 years, was starting my fellowship. Uh, so they are uh, really not that uh, recent past. The reported one-year survival from that European series was 62% and only an 18% five-year survival, is, which is what we get now, uh, as you saw in the chemo trials. Um, but a lot of those patients died because of graft loss and uh, practicing liver transplant now, we never ever lose a graft from recurrent hepatitis C for instance right now and in the 1990s every patient with uh, hepatitis C had recurrence and half of them lost their graft within five years. So it's a different uh, world in terms of liver transplantation as well as the oncologic uh, colorectal cancer world having changed and so we really only have one study study from the truly modern era, beyond 2000 even, uh, that looks at liver transplant for colorectal cancer. And that's the CICA trial, which also came from Oslo, uh, where we saw some of the prior um, uh, laparoscopic resection data coming from. So this began in 2006. They selected 25 patients with colorectal carcinoma, metastatic only to the liver. 21 of the 25 patients made it on to transplant. Four were found to have node positive or metastatic disease uh, and didn't undergo transplant. And they used whole cadaveric organs because unlike Americans, uh, in Oslo, they have more organs than they have patients who need transplants living a, a wholesome lifestyle. Um, so they got whole livers. They initially tried to restrict inclusions, but then liberalized their criteria after the first couple of patients were done in the first year. So they only truly excluded patients who had extra hepatic disease that they knew about and poor for, uh, performance status with a low ECOG score. Uh, everybody had six weeks minimum of neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, the primary tumor had to be out at the time that they underwent the transplant. Nobody got adjuvant therapy after transplant, and this is what the outcomes look like. So the disease-free survival was low. Um, everybody was, um, had recurrence by three years. But if you look at the overall survival, it's markedly better than any series that you would see now with a combination of resection and chemotherapy. Uh, so five-year survival of 60% is three times that what we would achieve now uh, in, uh, in many resection and chemo um, uh, trials and certainly for unresectable liver disease uh, with chemo alone, which runs 18 to 20 percent. Uh, 
Important caveats are that they were not very strict in the original uh, selection criteria in CEQA 1, and many, if you looked back, and the authors did when they wrote the paper, uh, many of the recurrences actually were likely lung lesions that were there prior to um, transplant, and they did not use, uh, for instance, PET scanning, and they didn't selective bi uh, uh, selectively biopsy small uh, lung lesions uh, to assure that they were uh, benign prior to going to transplants. If you looked at the biologically favorable uh, cases, then they had a, a significantly improved survival, actually, in this study. So they did a retrospective analysis uh, and looked at subsets. And if you excluded the patients with large tumors, CEA uh, that was very high in a short disease-free interval, or that had progressive disease during the neoadjuvant uh, therapy treatment where they didn't have, quote, control of the tumor, those were all negative predictive factors. And so you look, it's a small number of patients that didn't have those. But if you look, if they had only zero, one, or two of those factors, now you got a 70% five-year survival uh, versus the small uh, number that had advanced uh, uh, disease or high-risk factors. So if we look at the outcomes of liver transplant for other cancers that we do, and we have a tumor oncology um, transplant uh, program at Georgetown, and we routinely transplant hepatocellular carcinoma with within Milan criteria, quote, good risk patients. And, and we do that every single day in every liver transplant program around the United States. And the survival at five years is exactly the same as in this CEQA-1 trial, which had uh, poor or, or loosely selective criteria. And if we look at advanced tumors between five and eight centimeters for hepatocellular carcinoma, and we still do those in protocol, we get about a 50, 55% um, five-year survival. So we are already seeing um, at least proof of concept in the first trial that has been done that we could potentially get outcomes that are consistent with what we transplant for other cancers. And if we look at uh, modern uh, best practice chemotherapy in the same Nordic population that underwent transplant, and that uh, is done here looking at the Nordic trial, Nordic 7 trials, the same population, liver only, metastatic, but under resectable colorectal cancer, best chemo versus transplant, that you can see still the survival advantage holds in the uh, transplant group versus non-transplant. So in summary, even in the uh, CICA patients with the worst biology demonstrated by progression in all lines of chemo, the median overall survival was still uh, more than double what we would get in, in uh, ideal chemotherapy trial. So there are five or six trials. These are five uh, listed that are actually uh, open to enrollment right now in um, North America and Europe. Uh, so there is the beginning, I guess we would, um, I would refer to these as the innovators or early adopters uh, of transplant for limited, appropriately selected colorectal. And at Georgetown, we have a trial that is just uh, finishing up going through the IRB, and we're beginning to evaluate patients now. Liver-only unresectable disease studied both with CT and PET scanning and biopsy of any questionable lesions outside of the liver is required. We'll take both synchronous and metachronous disease, but we have uh, decided to eliminate to, to uh, not to transplant um, BRAF um, mutant patients who have a worse overall outcome. Pre-transplant chemotherapy will be a minimum of four to six months, uh, and we have to have control of the tumor with chemo um, evidenced by either a low uh, falling CEA or uh, a decreasing tumor burden on scanning. And then we'll do intraoperative uh, lymph node biopsy and then generally a right lobe live donor liver transplant if the nodes are negative. So yesterday, um, I had a, a quick discussion right before we get to the bar, had a quick discussion with a 39-year-old patient uh, who has a left pedicle hyalur cholangiocarcinoma that invades into the portal vein and obstructs it and goes into the right anterior sectoral portal and right anterior bile duct. And this guy does not have cirrhosis, he does not have sclerosing cholangitis, and he would not 
have six months ago, in my mind, been a candidate for a transplant. But as the Mayo Clinic protocol has generalized across the world and experience has increased, this non-serotic, non-liver disease patient is 39, six months ago, I know I would have done the status quo, which is a left triseg with a rue to his left posterior sectoral bile duct, and he would have done excellent. Maybe had a little cut surface bile leak, gone home in a week and a half, and he would have recurred a year later later and died. And instead, I would say um, through innovation, early adoption, and probably now we're at a point where we're starting to um, define a new standard for a 38-year-old guy with an aggressive locally advanced Clangio, we're thinking to give him neoadjuvant and move him on to transplant. So I think, yes, we should offer limited um, liver transplant for colorectal disease, but it should be studied carefully in selected centers, uh, and then we should uh, redefine our criteria as we move along. So thank you all.